Today we're jumping into Luke chapter 16. And I, I was a bit excited about doing 31 verses, but we're not going to do 31 verses. So. We'll probably do 14 verses. Because I forgot today was communion. And you need to make time for these things. But you don't care. Just, I'm just telling you. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this time together. And Lord, for the remembrance of what you have done for us, the purchase of our lives back from sin. And I pray that you'd help us to be worthy of that that you would help us walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling, that you might aid us and assist us, and by your spirit, that as we look at your word, that we might learn. Sometimes your word is difficult to understand, and yet, Lord, we have your Holy Spirit, and then you help us. So, Lord, here am I. Take all of me, each one of us, Lord. Help us to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this morning we're going to talk about money. <laughs> These poor nice people that came for the first time, they're like, oh, they're one of those churches. <laughs> Actually, probably about half of all the parables that Jesus told in the Synoptic Gospels were about money. Not money like you hear on TV, though. It's very different, and our perspective on it and our outlook on it is very different than God's view. And so as we read through the scripture, you might be a little confused. In fact, this is one of the more difficult sayings of Jesus, but I hope by the time it's over, you guys have a fairly good understanding as to what it means. Uh, the highlight verse for today is in verse 13, which is, no servant can serve two masters, for he, he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or, or money making money your God. You can either have God as God or you can have money as your God. And you have to take your pick and choose. So that's what it says in verse 13. Just to remind you where you are and what we talked about last week. Last week we were in Luke 15. We went through the entire chapter. You're going to see it talks about lost things. We saw a lost sheep and a shepherd that went and left the 99 in the wilderness and went and found that one sheep. And when he found it, he walked into town and he went home and he said, look, I found the sheep that I lost. And his wife probably would have said, where's the other 99? <laughs> Jesus was saying this in response to the Pharisees who were condemning of Jesus because of the people he spent time with. Jesus spent time with lost people. It wasn't like a private little club, you know, where the disciples all formed a line and had their sunglasses on and their earpieces in and they kept people away. Although they did do that. Jesus tried to explain God's heart towards lost things to the place where he'd leave 99 in the wilderness to go find the one lost one. There was a woman who lost a coin. And it says, who, which one of these women, who having 10 coins, by the way, it was a, it was a necklace that they would wear on their head. I guess you'd call it a headless. I don't know. A headband, a headband. There it is, there it is. There are people smarter than me here. But it was an indication, much like a wedding ring, and these 10 coins would actually provide for her if her husband happened to die, and so it was, a, it was kind of a bank account at the same time as it was a showing of being married, and if the husband saw one of them was missing, he might think, what's the matter? You're not so proud to be married to me anymore? You know, it's like a smile with a missing tooth. So. So she loses this coin in her house, so she sweeps her entire house and she finds it, and then she spends $50 on Dunkin' Donuts and has a party with her friends and says, look, I found the coin that I lost. That's the way God feels about lost people. And it says that there's more joy in heaven over one soul that gets saved that over 99 in the wilderness that have no need of repentance, speaking of the sheep. And then the last story is the lost son. Of course, you know it as the song, uh, the, the, the parable, if you will, of the prodigal son. Uh, prodigal means excess uh, or, or extravagance. It's actually the prodigal father. It was he who was excessive because the son says, listen, I want my portion of the inheritance now. And the father does what I would think never to do. 
he parted out his property and he gave him his inheritance early. And the son took the money and he went off into a far country and he spent it on prostitutes and parties and, and anything he wanted to and he lived extravagantly in a wasteful fashion. And then when he ran out of money and a famine hit the land, he had to sell himself out as a slave to feed pigs. And he wanted to eat the food the pigs were eating. This is a good Jewish boy. This was a detestable thing for him to do. And yet he had to do it to live. And then he says that he came to himself. And he thought to himself, how many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food to spare? I know what I'll do. I'm going to go home. And I'm going to tell him, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I have no right to be called your son any longer. Treat me like one of your hired hands. And he, he thinks, I'm going to go home and beg. So he goes home with no shoes. He goes home dirty. And he trudges his way home. And it says, while he was a far way off, the father saw him. Which means he was looking. Perpetually. As God does for the lost. And he came back and he started with this speech. Father, I'm, I've sinned against God and against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. And he didn't even get it out of his mouth. His father was crying on him and, and hugging him. And he called for a robe. Because apparently he wasn't clothed well. Clothed him up. Put a ring on his finger, which is a sign of authority from the father. And put sandals on his feet so that he wasn't walking barefoot anymore. Absolutely lavished him with love and said, listen, come on. Let's have a party. Let's kill the fatted calf. Let's have, a, let's have a blowout party. And he makes a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice for this boy. And they have a party. And you would say, the end, happy story, except there's another son. And he's in the field. He's the older son. <clears throat> you know how it is to be the older, some of you. I'm the oldest of three boys. You tend to take charge, especially if dad is not around. You become dad, dysfunctionally. And he says, wait a minute, what's the sound I hear of partying and, and, and joy? He was angry because he heard joy. You know, there are people that are that way. They hear joy and they get angry. And he goes, well, your, your brother's come back. He's come back alive and your father's having a party. He killed the fat calf and everything. And the son would not go in. The father came out and pleaded with him and said, listen, this is your brother. He, he was dead. Now he's alive. He was lost. Now he's found. We need to rejoice. And he goes, you've never given me even so much as a goat for me and my friends. And the father answers peculiarly. He says, everything I have is all yours. In other words, we could have had that done a long time ago if you would have said something. Because he was jealous. Jesus said all of this in response to the Pharisees seeing Jesus spend time with sinners and tax collectors. If you guys are doing your taxes, you know tax collectors aren't always nice people. And so Jesus tells us about lost things and how our attitude should be towards lost people. Not, ew, get away from me, but how can I help you? Because God cares for you and he loves you. So that's what we talked about last week. If you weren't here, he didn't miss anything. There you go. <laughs> this was my last slide that I didn't pull up. What we learned from that is that God loves and seeks hard after the lost. People are hopelessly lost and they cannot find God, but they must be found by him or return to him if you've come to know him, such as the parable of the, the lost son. People are willfully lost. In 1 Timothy 2.4, it says, all who desire... Oh, I'm, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God's heart for the lost is that everyone comes. No one is excluded. I used to think that I was too dirty, rotten, nasty, and I had committed things that were unspeakably unforgiving. That passage tells me that's not true. And if it's true for me, it's true for, the, for everyone else. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And someday we'll get there. To verse 9, chapter 19. Romans 3, verses 10 and 12 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside and have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Without being born again, without having a born again experience with Jesus Christ, we're hopeless. We're broken. We're sinners. We're addicts to something, whether it be money or whether it be fame or whether it just be self on the throne. It's always us. Romans 8 verses 6 to 7 says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity or, or against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Do you realize that a person that does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, they can't do the right thing. It would be cruel and unusual for you to tell somebody they should straighten up and fly right and do the right thing because they can't. That's like telling a drug addict, hey, you should just stop. <laughs> wow, I wish I thought of that earlier. It would save me a lot of trouble. <laughs> we are willfully lost and, and we need to be found by God. This week, we're going to talk about stewardship and money. And if I went all the way to verse 31, we would talk about the rich man and Lazarus, which we're not going to have time for. But we're going to talk about it next week. Same bat channel. So I promise you, unless the Lord takes me home. Chapter 16, verse 1. He also said to his disciples, this is Jesus speaking, there's a certain rich man who had a steward. An occasion was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and he said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be steward. And then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of my stewardship, that they may receive me into their homes or their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him, and he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And so he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 50. And then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So the master commended the unjust steward, because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in much. Therefore, if you have been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you and trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. You see, they knew that he was talking about them, because he was talking about money, and they didn't have the right attitude. How many of you are confused by this parable? Only five, six, seven, ten honest people. Okay, good. Good. Good, I have some work to do. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about money. Everybody's favorite subject. <laughs> Sometimes our money changes depending on what's going on. Everyone seems to think it is the answer to all of their troubles. There was a, a, there was a poll that was done among people and people that were making around $50,000 a year said what they needed to be comfortable would be $100,000. Those who were making over $100,000 said if only they had $200,000, they would be comfortable. 
And so the principle is this, whatever it is you're making, most people believe they need twice that amount to be happy. And of course, money won't make you happy. It might make you laugh, some of it. By the way, did you know that there's a $100,000 bill? True, honest, I'm not lying. And there it is, there's a copy of it. Uh, don't try it on your printer, I don't think it'll work. <laughs> this one isn't real. A $4 billion bill does not exist with Donald Trump on it. <clears throat> so the scripture says in verse one, he also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward. An occasion was brought to him. This man was wasting his goods. By the way, you'll notice this word wasting is exactly what was said of the prodigal son. He went and took all of his finances and wasted them on wild living, on prodigal living. So Jesus is kind of stringing the pearls here and putting them together. By the way, a steward, if, if you don't know what a steward is, it's not the, the male stewardess. A steward is one who is in charge to take care of somebody else's positions. We would call them a manager, typically over property or an estate. So it's, it's like not, not steward. This is different. It's, it's not a steward. It's a steward. I know, you know, English in New Jersey is fractured. So he's got this manager. The rich guy has a manager. So he's probably somebody living in a city and he has farms and property and he has a man who's watching over all this stuff, which he typically would have. And he wants to make sure that the, the farms are run well and everything's taken care of and, you know, things that need to be fixed get fixed and, you know, you get all these things. And also that the people who are farming the land give the boss his percentage and so there's a percentage of what you agree to, hey, I'll work your land, I'll live here, and I'll give you this much of your property and the rest of it I'll keep for a profit. So that's what they would do in an agrarian society, which we, even though we're in a garden state, we don't do that here. So the guy's wasting his money. We're not given a lot of uh, background as to what that means. Maybe he's got his feet up on the desk and he's doing nothing, maybe he's lazy, maybe he doesn't come in for days at a time, and, or maybe he's just not getting done what needs to get done, but he's burning up some money. I don't know about you, but waste, just that word just bothers me. Waste, I, I have a problem with wasting food. That's why I eat it all. <laughs> I'm serious, I was taught I was not able to get up from the table unless I ate all the food. And I, I attribute that to my parents and shame on them. Shame on me. I hate wasting food. If it was prepared and it was put on my plate, it came from somewhere far away. We had to spend money to get it there. Somebody heated it up at least, cooked it and put some nice flavorful things on it and gave it to me. So I should at least do the dignity to the, the people all along the food chain who got it there. I'm gonna eat it. I, I, I just need to do it in smaller amounts. I hate wasting food. And you know, if you ever waste food, if, if you had older parents, um, you know, they said, you know, don't throw that out there, people starving in the world. Which I understand, especially if you live through the depression. If your parents went through that, uh, my goodness, uh, they're old. But they understand. <laughs> they understand what that is. So I hate waste. And the things that we spend money on, it's just so easy to go on Amazon and hit a click and you get it home. And I hate returns because returns are waste. It's a waste of your time that you went and shopped for the thing and got it to your house and then it turns out not to be the thing that you wanted or that fits and then it was misrepresented and then you have to get it shipped back which takes more time. Then you got to wait for the credit to hit your card if you use a card and it's like waste. Waste. I totally get it. Time. If you could have back all the time that you have wasted in your life how many more lifetimes would you live? I'm, I think of all of the inane things that I have spent time on and I have wasted it. You see, this guy is being called to account and Jesus is telling a parable. The landowner is God and we are the stewards. And so as I think through this story, I think, God, how much do I waste? 
And I just have a, I have a mental illness with waste. Like when my grandchildren are doing dishes. The first thing they do is they just turn the water on and walk away. And I'm paying for all that water. It's, it's like our most precious resource on the earth. And it's going down the drain. So I run over and shut off, say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm waiting for it to warm up. Well, don't put them both on. <laughs> and then they're doing dishes. You know, they're washing over here and the water's going. And they put the dish on the side and then they wash another dish and here's the water still running. It's like, who does this? <laughs> it's waste. You're not married to me. Thank God for that. <laughs> I, I hate waste. If there's a light on, if I walk into a room and nobody's there, light goes off. It might be more than one. Everywhere I go, light off, light off, light off, light off, light off, light off. And then when I turn around and I go back, people come back in the room, light on, light on, light on. <laughs> this is an honest truth. I'm telling you the truth. I will stumble around in the morning at 5 a.m. and not turn a light on. Because I need to exercise my mind so I don't get Alzheimer's. Where's the furniture? Oh, I left a shoe on the floor. I hate waste. I hate it. Absolutely hate waste. And you know those really wasteful incandescent bulbs that take up so much energy? I want to convert them all to nice LEDs, which take a lot less electricity, but I'll have to throw away a perfectly good light bulb. So I have to get a chart. Bill, perhaps you can help me. I need to get a chart and figure out what the cost effective savings is of throwing out a perfectly good bulb, spending money for a more efficient bulb. I get a little obsessed. The refrigerator. Children are hungry, they go to the fridge and they open it all the way and stand there. What are you doing? I don't know. That's what the two-year-old says. I don't know. What are you doing? You're letting all the cold air out. All the frozen things are melting. It's money. I hear cha-ching, 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 cha-ching in the back of my head. Close the door. Close it, close it now. What do you want? Cheese. OK. Let's make a map, and we'll figure out our plan of attack, and we'll open the fridge quickly. I hate waste. So when I read that a manager called his steward up, and he said, listen, I find out that you're wasting my stuff. You're done. I think, wow, I wonder what God thinks about my life and how I spend the most precious things I have, like time, which I'm running out of, as we all are, one day at a time. Our finances, our influence, how are we using those things for the kingdom of God, which is really what Jesus is talking about. And he says, so he called to him and he said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be a steward. How many of you ever been fired? Just fired? Ow, that hurts, right? Oh, by the way, you're a useless piece of garbage. Bye-bye. That, that's how it feels, you know. I'm so sorry to let you know that we don't need your, your services any longer. I'm so sorry, I hope everything works out. Your last check is here. We'll never see you again. Goodbye. <laughs> That's a terrible thing, especially if you work hard and pour yourself out and you think there's a future and you have some stability of financial income and suddenly it's gone. But this guy had made a lifestyle of being wasteful. He had to know it wasn't going to last. He had to know somebody was going to figure this out, right? So in 1 Corinthians, we're given some principles of stewards. It says, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Faithful means that you do what you're supposed to do all the time on a regular basis. That's what being faithful is. 
Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Let each one's praise will come from God. God knows what's going on in our heart and our head, and he knows how we spend our time. And what he asks of us is not that we do great things, but that we're faithful at what we have. Amen? Because some of us don't have a lot. You can't, you know, intellectually, physically, just don't have a lot. And so God doesn't expect us to do more than anybody else, but he expects us to be faithful. So that's a principle in the scriptures. In Luke 12, 42 to 44, you might remember the words of Jesus and the Lord said, then who is the faithful and wise steward whom the master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? By the way, it's one of the functions of a steward. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. He's talking about his second coming. Truly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all he has. Well, that's a great promise. But for this guy, he's kind of out of luck. Because his master said, listen, what is this I hear about you? You're wasting my stuff. So guess what? You're fired. <laughs> and it's a devastating thing if you've ever been fired. It's, it's a very difficult thing. And then you have to wonder what you're going to do and where you're going to go. So this guy goes through the same thing. There's a day coming for us all to give an account before God for our caretaking. I, I think about all the mistakes I made raising children. Oh, God, forgive me. That's why I take communion. All the mistakes I made being a, a husband and the mistakes I continually make as a pastor. I imagine you have some things in your life that you're not going to be proud of. When your life is over and you're cashing in all your chips and it's over, what'd you do with your life? How'd you spend it? How'd you spend your finances? How'd you spend your time? How'd you spend the things that you can do? I don't want to be found wasteful. And the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. So he realizes he's physically beyond the ability to do physical labor. I am ashamed to beg. And it's not very convincing when you have a suit on. I have resolved what to do so that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. He says, I've got an idea. So pay careful attention because this is a brilliant parable. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him, and he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And so he said to him, take out your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. By the way, that's 50% off today only. <laughs> and then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, well, take out your bill and write 80. He only gave that guy 20%. But you notice both of them were glad to write a check and get it done. You know, this is half today is better than not getting anything at all. And 80% is better than getting nothing at all. In fact, if any of you have had to go through uh, bankruptcy proceedings, this, this might sound very familiar to you. This guy says, I'm going to do all of my master's creditors a favor. I'm going to give him a discount. I'm still the steward until I go talk to the boss. I'm still working for him. He has the authority to do it. And he has this genius idea. What do you guys think? That's what I thought. So he's giving out discounts. It's a fire sale, boys and girls. Boy, don't you wish you owed this guy money. Now, you don't know, because it doesn't tell you, if he was foregoing his commission if he had put exorbitant rates upon them and he was just collecting what was due, you don't know the situation behind why he's doing what he's doing. But we do know what he did. How many of you think he had a right to do this? None of you. You're all very cautious, aren't you? He has a right because he's still employed. 
So the master commended, patted him on the back, gave him a little trophy, commended the unjust steward. By the way, he was an unjust steward that got commended. You guys have a problem with that? You were rotten and you did a good job. That's exactly what it says. The master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. By the way, that's us. Jesus is slamming us here. The people in the world are shrewder than the people in your church. Because they rip people off. Well, let's define the word shrewd. Shrewd, sharp judgment, astute. The people outside this room are sharper with their money in general than the people inside this room. Who's Jesus speaking to? The Pharisees who loved money. Remember the last verse, verse 14. The Pharisees were upset about this because this is not how they see things. The master, who's the master in this parable? God. Commended, said, you did a good thing, you bad person. You should be confused. That's the very next thing on my slide is why. He had an ingenious focus on the future. He had an ingenious focus on the future. You see, it wasn't about the here and now, it's about later. He was shrewd. Of course, he was underhanded, but he was shrewd to think of the future. You know what happens when you get saved and you grow in Christ a little bit and you memorize some passages and you get walking and you start doing some things right and you don't need training wheels anymore because you don't make really big stupid mistakes, except in here it's always a mess. Yeah. Yeah. And then you figure, hey, I could take it easy. What is that movie, Rated R? Eh, I probably can handle that. I'm pretty strong spiritually. What, what did I spend, seven hours in front of the TV? Really? That's not very forward thinking. It's not very future oriented. This guy was thinking about the future and his decisions. And that's what he was commended for the way that he did it, not what he did. That's why it's a very difficult parable to get, right? So explain it to all your friends, okay? Because they don't know either. <laughs> Investing in your own future as you utilize another's assets. That just seems wrong, doesn't it? There was a movie called Other People's Money. It's kind of the theme. You know, you use other people's money to make yourself rich. Do you realize that you own nothing? There's nothing that's yours. Your health, your life, your breath, the next heartbeat, all of your mental faculties, they're not yours. They're a gift from God. And he will require them back. And he's wondering, how'd you do with that? To him who much is given, much is required. We are utilizing all of these wonderful things that God has given us. And we're usually benefiting just ourselves. That's why tithing, oh boy, you said it. That's why tithing and giving is such an important thing. Because it separates us from the power of the money that money might have on us. When you give something to somebody else who doesn't have in the hopes that you're not continuing to help them stay in that place. You know, there's difference between, you know, teaching a man to fish and giving a man a fish. It's important that we do that because it separates the power of money from us. So, you know, half the homeless people that I see, if you're observant and if you go into the city, you'll see them all the time. You'll see a car parked around the corner and then these guys come out with their old cardboard boxes. But if you look carefully, like if you look at their shoes, 
Sometimes they're dressed really nasty, but they got new shoes on. You know, some of these guys are pulling 80 grand a year, the guys that are asking for money at the tunnels and stuff. I read, I read multiple articles on it. And then there are, there's like a whole new group of people that are homeless, and these are the people that were formerly rich. And so if you, if you think this couldn't happen, uh, you should talk to some of the guys at Enron. And I say to you, Jesus says, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. That when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He was faithful in what is least is faithful in much. And he was unjust in what is least is unjust in much. Did you guys catch that? Oh, good. I still have a job. Buy some friends and go to heaven. And I say, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. Buy yourself some friends. Doesn't it appear to say that? Yes. Okay. You know, money can't buy you love. I just thought I'd interject that. And if Barbie is so popular, why do you have to buy her friends? It appears to say that you should take your money and buy some friends so that you could go to heaven. My friend Sean is disgruntled. He's like, oops, oops the pastor, that's not right, that's not right. <laughs> what it says is you should make your money to invest in the kingdom of God by giving it away to people that they might see the love of our God in your giving. Does that make more sense? Yeah. Use your cash as a tool. It is a terrible, terrible master, but it's a wonderful tool. Can you use money to invest in the kingdom of God? Yes. Absolutely, I trust that you all do. That's what he's saying. Proverbs 11.30 gives us a, a principle. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Listen, if I can buy somebody a meal, and while they're eating it, I can tell them about Jesus Christ and how their soul can be saved, not just their body from the meal I'm feeding them. If I can send money to missionaries overseas. In Luke 12, 33 to 34, it says, Sell what you have and give alms. Jesus is saying this, by the way. Provide for yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. If any of you have ever bought a stock, you know what this means. You buy a stock and you're like, awesome, I expect it to go up. And so what do you do? You check on it. Every day. Oh, S&P's up. Oh, it looks good. Or, oh no, oh no, it went down. Oh no, I heard some bad news. Because wherever you put your cash, that's where your heart goes. I always thought wherever your heart is, that's where you put your money. But it's the other way around. Wherever you put your money, that's where your heart is. So the question is, what do you spend your money on? That, those are the things you love. Naturally because your heart is going to follow your money. Make sense? So, I want you to take a moment and imagine your arrival in heaven. Now imagine that at this moment, you decide you're going to live every moment of your life for that moment. That's what Jesus is talking about. Imagine the children that will come up and you will see them and not recognize them and they'll say, hi, who are you? And they're going to explain that one time you were a Sunday school teacher and you shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with them and they got saved. And now they're going to spend eternity in heaven. Or you're going to see some kid because you spent $20 every month and you supported them in some faraway place. They ate and they had a life and they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and they will come up and greet you 
when you get to heaven because of the investment of your finances. You don't do it to get to heaven. You do it because you're going to heaven and you don't want to be alone. So Jesus says, use your money, this unrighteous mammon, because money's kind of dirty. You don't know where it's been, what it's used for, what kind of transaction it's been involved in. If you can use that to point people to Jesus, if you can do that to supply their physical needs so that they might have an ear and a heart that is willing to listen to what you have to say about all the rest of their life when they leave this life, it's worth it. Amen? Amen. And so we invest our money in the kingdom. How would you change your lifestyle, your activity, your spending? If you were living for that moment, you know, I probably wouldn't put all my money into here and now, and I wouldn't put it into having a larger wardrobe or having an extra car, or, you know, several extra houses or, you know. What does it do for eternity? What does it do for people that God loves in the light of how he feels about lost people? How should we then live with our finances? Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you the trust of true riches? In other words, if you don't do well with money, who's going to give you anything that's really worth much? And if you've been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what's your own? That makes sense. If you're not going to be a good steward of the things that God gives to you, what do you think is going to happen when you get on the other side? If you're not going to be faithful with what you have. And I think of children like this little girl who was learning how to bake all on her own. And she got the flour out. It wasn't her flour, it wasn't her cabinet, but she felt the liberty to go in there and just make a mess. Who is going to help you and give you your own stuff if you take everybody else's stuff and mess it up, right? The person that you want to give your finances to, if they're a financial planner, is somebody that's smart and shrewd, and they make a profit. You're not going to give it to them if they lose all the time, right? So what happens if the things that God has given us, which is everything, and we don't take care of it, what's going to happen on the other side? Or if we are faithful with it, what will happen on the other side? That's an interesting question. So when you have stuff that somebody else's and you don't take care of it, what do you think is going to happen when you have your own stuff? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Jesus says there's only one who's in charge. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard these things and they derided him. You see, that was Jesus' whole point in saying this. You can't serve God and money. It's going to be either your priority is the kingdom of God and you're going to serve him or you're going to serve stuff. And it's, you, you might even think it's for you. But there's a time when each one of us is going to have to stand and give an account before God for our lives, how we spend our time and our treasures, how we spend our finances, how we exercised our influence. All of those things we'll have to stand before God for. I can do a whole lot better. How about you? I can do a whole lot better. I got some things on the top of my list in my head that I'm going to address and take care of as a result of doing the study. I hope you guys are the same because this is God's word and this is kingdom truth. We must be sure to keep our priorities because money is a great servant but a cruel master. And you'll find it grows wings and flies away. Did you know money talks? It says bye-bye. <laughs> so why not serve the Lord with your money? Not because I need a raise, because I'm good. And our church is well, and we have people here that understand this principle, and that's why our church is here. That's why you see nice instruments and a stage and comfortable chairs. That's why the lights are on. Because there are those of you here that really get this 
and I am proud to be your pastor. I'm still a little amazed <laughs> that you'd sit up and put up with my silliness. Use worldly wealth to gain friends. Friends that will last for eternity. So that when you fail, in other words, when you're done and you die, they will welcome you. And your work here won't be wasted. Amen. Amen.